Well, you won't hear anything about Reverend Right or Reverend Wrong. Why? Because it's Sound Month and Review Time. Joel Conley of the PI, Mike Seeley of the Weekly, right here on Public Exposure. I'm Stan Emmer. So let's get to some stuff here. Mike, Joel, good to see you back. All right, good to be here. Let's talk about this wonderful city that we live in, Seattle. Just an absolutely gorgeous place. Let's get the, some wonderful pictures that we have up of Seattle. There's just, there is the Chamber of Commerce nighttime site. Let's go to some other sites of the city, though, that seem to be happening. Yeah, a little bit. And let's go. Seattle voters beware. We've got some levies that might be coming our way. Sound Transit, another six billion. Pike Place Market, 75 million. City Parks, 150 million. Infrastructure levy, uh, two of them are already in place. There we are, Joel, let's go to your column. Of uh, just the other day, enough with the levies already. You say, placing core, well, this was quoting a gentleman, Paul Guppy from the Washington mm -hmm. Policy Center. Placing core functions on special levies makes voters feel they must either agree to pay higher taxes or go without a vital public service. This is Seattle, I'm ready to pay. Uh, we always seem to be ready to pay. We seem to be ready to pay more and more and more to the point where, um, uh, again, there's a real issue here as to whether the middle class can afford to live in what has been the quintessentially American middle class city because we have, uh, we have not only luxuries like the new library, but we have basic services being paid for by bond issues. For instance, uh, Elliott Avenue, just north of the PI, is being vandalized at the moment. This, is a, you know, this repaving project is part of the $365 million streets levy that was passed a couple of years ago. One would normally think the city would repair streets and things like this as part of its, uh, part of its operating budget. Not here. Here, they went to the voters with a big gold-plated bond issue, the largest in city's history. Uh, the people who rent voted for it. The people who uh, own their houses tended to vote against it. It passed with 53%. So again, we stack these things one on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. On the one hand, while Sound Transit is thinking of increasing our sales taxes by four tenths or five cent, uh, or, or, or a half a or a half a cent, and. Uh, what is a famous uh, statement by Senator Dirksen of Illinois? A billion dollars here and a billion dollars there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. Mike, the Seattle Weekly readers are are they tired of uh, of all the taxes that people that they pay? No, but our readers are to the extreme left. But um, I'll tell you, I kind of am. Um, as a relatively new homeowner, I think it's time to say no to parks. And it's not that I don't love parks. No to parks? Exactly. It's just I, I'm, I'm tired of all the park levies. I'm very, very happy with um, our parks in Seattle. And what are they going to do, stop mowing the lawn and cleaning the urinals? I mean, is that what it's going to well, come to if we don't? we already stopped cleaning. Well, we, we stopped we cleaning started, the urinals yeah. When, yeah. The, when we bought the self-cleaning ones. But then that didn't really work because they couldn't, they, they couldn't flush them out or whatever they have to do with them. So. Right. And we stopped cleaning those urinals. But, yeah, it, it, it's a great point that Joel's column made. It's... You know, these are basic functions that our normal tax dollars should pay for. Well, so it comes back to a question of leadership and priorities. We, are we lacking in both? I think we have a Seattle city government that has an instinct for the capillary, that on the one hand we have the ma major problems that keep festering, witness your slide, your, uh, slide of the, uh, the traffic buildups and so on. On the other hand, uh, a kind of a, uh, we're kind of like Gulliver being tied down by all of these levies and taxes, and also by an increasing emphasis of the, uh, the nanny state, you know, from, uh, from plastic bags to separating garbage, one thing and another like this. I'm part of a breakfast group in Madrona with uh, the People's Food Commissar, Richard Con Conlon, and I'm kind of, kind of afraid he's going to start telling me what to eat, and if I leave something on my plate, what I have to do with it. <laughs> well, I did want to ask, though, um, you talked about a sound transit, $6 billion plus uh, potential mm -hmm. that we're looking at. Uh, Pike Place Market, the city coming at us for $75 million in repairs, mm -hmm. and the city parks, again, $150 million. Um, will Seattle vote no to those? Um, probably not. 
Um, I kind of hope. So you're going to get the, your parks whether you like it or not. I, I hope I don't get park improvements because <laughs> I'm I'm happy with them. Now the the, the one area where I am uh, Richard Conlin is on uh, Sound Transit. I just think we should build trains on every road at all costs. Um, but we'll get into my frustrations with that later, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we actually will. In fact, it may be time to get into that right now. The downside of increased ridership. This is from Mike Seeley in the Weekly. Today, as a, ma a matter of fact, here's a little quote from you. After the 922, which was the second bus, I guess, mm -hmm. failed to stop for me, I walked home, got in my car, and drove to work alone. Yeah, I had two buses this morning that did not stop on uh, Del Ridge because they were supposedly too full and you know to the naked eye the first bus in Chicago or New York would have been considered empty um, the second bus was actually too full but that's a problem that compounds itself and it's a problem we as a city and I guess a county run into when we we rely exclusively upon buses for public transit well I, I guess you, I want to go back to your first statement. You said that in Chicago or New York, the buses would have been considered empty. So you're right. saying that people weren't standing in the aisles. People were standing in the aisles, but they weren't sitting on one another's laps. Oh, I see. see? I see. So, I mean, we, you know, Seattle reminds me of, of kind of a, a gorgeous 25-year-old who's not quite ready for the, the, the uh, responsibilities of adulthood. And yet we're in a city that's all grown up in some respects, mm -hmm. and we're just not... Did a couple of years ago, though, we passed one of Ron Sims uh, express bus bond levies. You know, one of those things that's supposed to uh, great, greatly increase the number of Metro Express buses on heavily used routes into the city. Delridge is a classic, uh, classic example of such a route. One can ask the question, where are Sims buses that we are paying for? I, I think they're supposed to come in 2009. I actually got some response from the county on that. We paid for them, what, last year, two years ago? Mm. But it doesn't actually kick in, just like Sound Transit. Well, who's minding the store? It seems like it's you guys. You guys are the, are the only ones that are calling in on this. And, uh, but, but, you know, who wants to run for office here in Seattle to change things? Um, and, and is being an office holder in Seattle so lucrative that you will do anything you can to keep it? Interesting questions. First of all, the city council certainly pays very, very well. Secondly, we have a tight little political machine in City Hall where I believe the top salaries are in six figures. Um, so essentially those who are making the decisions of what is, what is good for us are in fact able to afford what they are charging for life here. Uh, again, you have, the, however, the situation is that, how do, I, how do I put this? You get all of this stuff in your mailbox put together by the political uh, consultants talking about affordability, maintaining middle class values, maintaining Seattle as a livable city. Uh, that's what is run on, but uh, interest groups with, uh, with demands um, take over once the election is over. And I, again, I'm not against parks, and I'm not against the, uh, the Pike Place market and so on, but sometimes you have to choose between good things. You know, at home, there are about three or four things that I need to have done. Um, I have to establish a priority according to what I can afford, and why can't they? No, you don't. Richard Conlon's going to do that for you. Let's go to Joni Balter's column uh, just of uh, very recently. It's called Richard's World Part Two. But before we go to that, I just want to remind everyone that once a month right here on Public Exposure, Joel Conley of the PI and Mike Seeley of the Weekly come by and wax poetic, eh, maybe sometimes. Be sure to pick up the newspaper, the Weekly, uh, on the newsstand. Be sure to pick up the PI as well, right at the newsstand, or go to the websites, or maybe both. Uh, actually, you do need to do both because the blogs are in addition, and we're going to get those websites up on the screen throughout the show. Uh, now, Richard's World Part 2. This is what Joni Balter says. Richard's world is becoming a place where we perform all the chores in a given day Conlon assigns us. And then he has some city legislation about healthy eating, militant vegetable growing, greenhouse gas reduction opportunities related to food, obesity, food waste, access to farmers markets. Aren't we lucky that Richard is our king? To a degree we are because uh, all the this, this stuff he's promoting um, is great. The question is, is it his job to be, as Joni adroitly points out, our, our dad? 
Um, probably not. And where I have beef with Richard Conlon is not with his ideas, most of which I agree with personally. Mm -hmm. It's how he goes about foisting them upon the public, which tends to be more punitive, and I know better than you do, rather than in incentivizing and encouraging. Great point. I think it gets back to leadership and priorities, because when this happened and then when the, the bag, the grocery bag thing happened, it kind of shocked me. There was no no team, no feeling that we're all in this together to try to reclaim our planet. Remember when C Seattle became one of the first cities in America to adopt recycling. Mm -hmm. I lived at the time in Washington, D.C., a city which wastes as a matter of principle. <laughs> and here in Seattle was clean as a matter of principle. But the situation was that uh, uh, there was an appeal to the better angels of our nature and to the, uh, to the ingenuity and the spirit of a cooperation that sometimes does infect the United States. And we do things like, well, beat the Nazis when it does um, and outproduce them and send people to the moon. But instead you have, I think, with common a classic kind of planner's mentality where, as you've accurately suggested, it is punitive, it is nanny state, it is, you know, eat your broccoli um, and um, or, find, or we'll find something to do with it. And um, I'm, again, Reading his resolution, I was impressed with his goals and so on, but the amount of finger wagging and the amount of nanny state is simply excessive and the sort of thing that basically you kind of get your back up. Well, just, just to take the metaphor a bit further, you have to serve ice cream with the broccoli, and he's just serving broccoli. Mm. Right? <laughs> well, but you can't carry it home in a plastic bag or a paper bag from the grocery store unless you pay an extra 20 cents per bag. And, you know, here they are, and I'm, and I'm actually kind of curious. Part of the reason for getting rid of the plastic bags is because of the oil content in them. Let's go on the next click, because right here, there's a, there's a plastic Coke bottle, or Diet Coke bottle there, and, and plastic jugs, when if we go to the next click and take us back a few years, there were glass recyclable jars of milk and glass re uh, recyclable Coca-Cola bottles. Still are in Europe, where I just was. So. If the city is really, really serious, why don't we, instead of picking on bags, pick on bottles? Because the uh, because the aluminum industry, the bottling industry, and so on, have spent millions and millions of dollars to beat to death uh, returnable bottle initiatives when they come onto the uh, when they've come onto the ballot in the state, and various Naderite organizations have ceased uh, sponsoring them. So naturally, what you do is. Uh, is uh, foisted all on the lady that I met in the parking lot of the Red Apple on Jackson, um, you know, with a great big family that needs a whole bunch of milk. Hmm. Well, are your readers at the Weekly willing to forego their plastic milk jugs and their plastic Coke bottles? Again, probably. Or their plastic water bottles. Again, probably our readers are, but I, I'm not convinced our readers speak for the majority of Seattle. Um, I, again, I think the way to go about encouraging use of something other than plastic or paper bags is not to come out and say we're going to tax you 20 cents a shot. It's to come out and say we're going to subsidize your buying a cloth bag, whether you know it, it's the government selling them themselves or the government giving them away or the government saying here's where you can go buy them. You have to encourage the use before you tax what you now consider to be a misuse. Mm -hmm. Something else that I think is actually is a good idea is uh, not allowing you to wash your car on, you know, in, in your backyard or on, your, on the alleyway because you're going to wash uh, away, you know, bad things into the sound. Here's something out of the weekly. What does Brown Bear want from city council? And um, Richard Conlon, uh, Council President Richard Conlon, who accepted a $500 donation from the owner of Brown Bear in 2005, says the car wash owner's growing interest in city politics is simply a natural outcropping of his environmental bent. Next quote, I think what may be happening is that this uh, is a company that can make a lot of money being green, and they want to encourage the city to practice green policies because it fits with their business model. What's wrong with that? Nothing, but then when the city goes to write the, the Stormwater Co., which is controlled by the city council, um, they, of course, will consider whether or not to ban residential car washing, which mm -hmm. in America to me is kind of like banning apple pie. Um, <laughs> you, you can criticize washing your car in your front yard, but, you know, it's one of those things. It's part of Americana. You can criticize apple pie as expanding your midsection, 
but you just don't go there. And I, you know, as good an idea as it might be, as much sense as it might make chemically, it's just going a little bit too far. A-W-M, angry white male over here. Is that what he is? But it's, it's kind of killing. Remember when I was growing up, uh, growing up in Bellingham, um, you know, there were the rituals of summer where people were out washing their cars on Sunday afternoon while the radio was blaring these nasal-voiced accounts, frantic nasal-voiced accounts of hydroplane races from Lake Washington. This was, you know, this was, this was kind of the culture of the time. And it's strange, the hydros, that the hydros survive. We're no longer killing the drivers. <laughs> um, but, uh, and we no longer have these great flip shots that you used to have in the paper. But we're banning the other part of it. We're banning the, uh, banning the, uh, banning the washing of the cars. And, you know, it's kind of, well. Who's going to um, enforce that is what I want to know. Well, no, we, of course, well, the city we, police well, are required to. Yeah, they're going to well, be. That's going to be top on their program. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, the car wash enforcers, uh, plastic bag police, uh, very you know, basically train uh, train young people to turn in their parents. I mean, uh, you you can you can take what starts out sensible, and take it to uh, take it to levels of absurdity, and the council is kind of on the border of doing that. Well, actually, that's a great point, and you asked a great question, who's going to enforce this? And, you know, and, and frankly, from a legislative standpoint, how smart a legislator are you if you pass a law that really can't be enforced? Not that smart. You know, that's not your job. Your job is to spend time. And how smart are we the people to keep reelecting them? Well, what choice do we have? I mean, we kind of get cookie-cutter candidates in some regard. Yeah, there we are. Let's go to some, some more water. This is clean, gorgeous water, and it's part of the Wild Sky. And in your column uh, of April the 30th, Wild Sky is a go at last. Murray's long crusade is crowned by success. Great quote from uh, Senator Murray. I've learned so many of life's lessons with this bill, exclaimed uh, Senator Murray, who has championed the Wild Sky wilderness area. We're going to get some pictures up, too, of Wild Sky while we talk about this. What did Senator Murray learn, and why did this take so long? Uh, what she learned was that uh, basically that you know large obstacles have, appear in the way of even the most reasonable uh, proposal. That she and uh, Representative Rick Larson, often nicknamed Ichabod, um, worked out uh, worked out the parameters of the bill uh, here in the state. They excised 4,000 acres that the snowmobilers wanted and so on. So they got what was essentially a non-controversial bill back in Washington, D.C., only to find it blocked first by Congressman Pombo of California, the Republican who headed the House Resources Committee. Why did he block it? He argued that there were some areas that uh, had already had already once been cut over in this, and that uh, wilderness, you know, this was this was his argument as a specious one, but it has to be absolutely pristine. So he naturally proposed to cut 13,000 acres of valley bottom, largely old growth. You know, the areas around the streams where the families can fool around and the uh, and the uh, fly fishermen can wade in, and so on from the bill. Murray would not go for it. Um, it is worth noting that wilderness is not a land that is always pristine, that I have tromped around areas uh, joining Shenandoah National Park back east where um, Stonewall Jackson's uh, uh, wagon trains, you know, once used in outflanking the Yanks in 1862 that are now designated wilderness. So he blocked this, and then Coburn blocked it in the Senate, and Murray... Uh, has a kind of intelligence which is never give up and if one route is blocked you find another so she ended up finding her way around Coburn by attacking the uh, attaching the wild sky to uh, a series of power, popular non-controversial land use proposals enlisting uh, the non-knuckle dragging uh, Republican senators Gordon Smith of Oregon for instance and uh, and uh, forcing cloture and then um, and then getting the bill through well that bring that begs the question then Mike if uh, we can protect uh, 106,000 yep. acres of wilderness area in Snohomish County. Why don't you want to protect a park in Seattle? Oh, I think they're protected. I don't see anyone building townhomes in the middle of the Arboretum. Um, I just think that, that it, it's a little bit ridiculous that we ask for so much money every year, every other year to uh, make improvements to park parks which are perfectly well maintained.
We're going to take another short break. Uh, once a month, right here, Mike Seeley of the Seattle Weekly, Joel Connolly of the Seattle PI, on Sound Month in Review, right here on Public Exposure. Go to the websites, learn more, pick up the newspapers on the newsstand. Um, Joel, you write a lot about uh, environmental causes. Why do you do that? Um, basically, we live in a part of the world surrounded entirely by envy. And uh, starting about 1977, starting about 30 years ago, we began to be afflicted by these national magazines that identified the Pacific Northwest as the most livable part of, a, part of, the, uh, of the world. And as a result of this, our population has more than doubled. Uh, and we are looking forward to forward to 1.7 million people moving into uh, the central Puget Sound area over the next 30 years. Uh, the lower Willamette Valley in um, Oregon and Clark County will get 1.4 million. Uh, lower mainland of British Columbia get 1.5 million. Um, and yet we have this beautiful natural setting which needs to be protected, preserved, safeguarded. And I tend to think that uh, with a certain degree of balance, maintaining uh, communities with a sense of community, maintaining uh, working forests, building, uh, building parks outside the city where, where, where they don't have enough parks, maintaining farmlands, we can continue to have a, have a balance and to maintain that livability. Otherwise, the sprawl simply goes all over the place. In fact, even goes over the over Snoqualmie Pass. And we lose the very, um, the very aspect of life here that has drawn so many people to the Northwest. Well, Mike, I think that's a perfect segue into um, Thomas Friedman's column in the New York Times. And the uh, column is entitled, Dumb as We Want to Be. And uh, let's go to the first quote. Few Americans know it, but for almost a year now, Congress has been bickering over whether and how to renew their investment tax credit to stimulate investment in solar energy and the production tax credit to encourage investment in wind energy. Next part of the quote. Oil and gas have kept all of their credits, uh, but those for wind and solar have been left to expire this December. I'm not making this up. At a time when we should be throwing everything into clean power innovation, we are squabbling over pennies. Mike, I know you don't cover national issues a lot in the Seattle Weekly, but this is the kind of thing that your readers would be very interested right. in knowing that is not happening in Congress. Uh, I don't know what more there is to say than, than <clears throat> what's been said there. I mean, it's such a no-brainer at this point with the, the energy crisis, crises we face in this country that, that we should be investing in alternative resources. It's, you, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing you wish you could throw everyone out of office for not supporting instantly, but um, you know, the rest of America, unlike Richard Conlin, is very slow to come around on a lot of this stuff. When you lived in St. Louis, um, if you were living there today, what would the people think if they heard or if they read this, this column? Uh, they'd be angry because it would probably cost jobs at the Ford plant. I mean, that's the reality in, in middle America, unfortunately. So while his column, dumb as we want to be, may, the, the, it may very well be right. We want to be this dumb. It's not that we want to be that this dumb. It's just that you know America at large hasn't provided a lot of economic opportunity in in areas in the interior of the country. Hmm. Is it that is that that the job of government? I don't know, but it's definitely a job to foster it. But being dumb loses your competitive advantage. For instance, we are requiring, I think, under the new law, that uh, new cars get 35 miles per gallon by the year 2020. Already the new models being produced in China and India require more than 40 miles a gallon. How will Detroit compete if it does not meet the mileage standards and so on and the, and, uh, and the pollution standards that are now the requirement in the rest of the world? Well, I guess we're going to have a bigger, sexier car or truck for uh, us to, uh, to buy uh, just as long as we have plenty of oil. That's and the I, issue, isn't it? And our dependence on foreign oil has, since 2001, gone from 57% to 67% at the same time when, of course, the Chinese and the Indian economies are themselves posing a great, you know, much, much greater demand. Mm -hmm. Is it any surprise that we see the prices we do? No, it's not. Um, great picture. Italian troops in the Soka Valley, uh, November 1917. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time for this, but, Joel, your column... Uh, Europeans know too well the waste of war. And then you say this in the column. We turn on our TV sets and hear Fox News pundits excoriate, uh, excoriate the, those among us who uh, counsel negotiation. Conservative intellectuals talk strategy with bloodless uh, certainty. Even though they've never gone near a battlefield, 
or driven an ambulance and we are going to put up some pictures of battlefields on the United States home front. And this, Joel, in this column, what were you, what were you trying to get through? N namely that they recognize having done incredibly stupid things and very brutal things in much of the, in the last century, notably during the period between 1917 and 1945, but again more recently in the former Yugoslavia. And having, uh, having, having done it, they are now saying never again. And that the historic rivals say France and uh, Germany, the, uh, the Chancellor and the President get together at Verdun at the, uh, in the mausoleum where you have the bodies of 135,000 soldiers to essentially reaffirm the fact that they will, they will not wage war on each other. This is not to uh, celebrate their intelligence. Heaven knows uh, we, uh, we saw a lack of intelligence as Hitler came to power and, and so on, but uh, at the same time, they have learned from the, uh, from the mistakes that so brutally cost them. Mike, is George Bush, has he been saying the same thing, never again, we're not going to wage war on the homeland of the United States, and that's why he went to Iraq to protect, it from, protect us from them? Uh, whether he's saying it or not is inconsequential. The, the fact remains that what he's doing and the, the way he's gone about his foreign policy puts us at greater risk than we could ever imagine to attack, in my opinion. So the people essentially are saying, we want out and we want out now. Uh, I think many of the people are. I think most people, at least, if not all people, are at least begging for a better strategy. A reasonable use of intelligence. Uh, of intelligence with a capital I or just with any I? Both. Well, with a, with a small I. Mm. Well, there we are. Well, there we could go to Reverend Wright and Reverend Wrong and, and Obama and Clinton, but we're not going to. We're just going to wait for next month on the next public exposure. Thank you both for being here, and thank you both for writing such very, very thoughtful columns. Your column, your, your blog entry about the, uh, the bus was very, very thoughtful, and a lot of people can identify with you on that. So thank you very much to both of you. Uh, and next week right here on Public Exposure, going to be a very, very important one. A 24-year veteran of the Navy and an Iraq veteran will be with us, as well as a psychiatrist who treats returning veterans from Iraq, and he's going to be discussing this high suicide rate among Iraq War veterans. We'll see you right here on Public Exposure next week.